<laughs> I was just saying how excited I am about this song. I've heard so many times. Okay, we have John Slayer in the house. John, what's up, my man? Yo, yo, yo. So after um, how many months and weeks of me <laughs> telling to you you should come over for a little chat, and this finally is happening. Dead right, man. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah, well, listen, we uh, we can't complain because we've been very busy with work, which is good. We certainly have been, and it has been just an ace of a year when it comes to work, yeah. Yeah, and so me and John, we both are stunt performers, and... Uh, John, when did you qualify for uh, British Stunt Register? I uh, got onto the Stunt Register in June of 2018. Yeah, 2018. So that's what, three and a half years now? Yeah, yeah, I got on 2015, so yeah. it's just a little bit earlier. But before you got on Register, you have a whole lots of other <laughs> interesting things going on, which I can't just wait to and talk about. But before we get into that, um, as I usually go with my guests, I ask them, uh, where they're from, th- where did gra- where did they gra- grew up, and a little bit about your family, your school. So yeah, I grew up in South Africa on the east coast. Uh, a city called Durban is the nearest city to us. I am. My parents had a house in a little suburb called Everton, which was about thirty kilometers inland. <coughs> And yeah, that's where I grew up. My dad is a marine biologist, professor of marine biology, studied coral reefs for, well, he just retired after 49 years at the same institution. And where did he do that? Was it all South Africa or all over the world? All over the world, yeah. Mm. He was he was based in, in obviously, at the Institute on, on the Durban beachfront, but um, yeah, worked uh, globally on coral reefs. Studied everywhere from the Pacific, Indian Ocean, Atlantic. Um, yeah, um, fantastic job that he had. And is he retired now, or uh, retired? Yeah. Well, you know, academics. It's it's like your y- your you know your your body might slow down, but your brain mm. never has to. And the great thing about being an academic is, uh, as long as all the marbles are there, you know. Yeah. You, you've still got a role. So he has retired from the institution, but he still does field trips. He still helps students, you know, master's students, PhD students with their research. Uh, just this last week, he was back up the northeast coast of South Africa, scuba diving coral reefs. How old is he? He's in his 70s now, oh, okay. mid-70s. So, yeah, still going strong, man. Does he, like, looks after his health, and is he conscious of it? or He does. Uh, look, he's, he's never been... You know, kind of an an athlete. Mm. Um, so, but he's he's never been. You know, uh, he's never never let himself go. I suppose you could yeah. say. Um, he's he's not. You know, we're kind of sports people. You know, my background was was in in the Royal Marines, which is kind of elite military. You know, you, you had your your dancing and, and martial arts background. <laughs> and like and the comparison, <laughs> I was in Royal Marines. You were in dancing, Renard. It's exactly fucking the same. <laughs> you went through all tough shit. Yeah, <laughs> but it's really physical, isn't it? It's 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 elite it physical performance. John, so. it can be. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh my God! It's time. Where is it? Wait. Hey, <laughs> such a delay. <laughs> Get that one in. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so yeah. that's your dad. What about your mom? So my mom is a uh, counselor in the church. So she's really been helping out with the community for many years. And uh, yeah, that, that's. she stayed at home and looked after us as kids, me and my brother, early on. Uh, I think probably... She went back to work when I was about 10 years old uh, and she went straight into the church then, did a counselling course and basically, uh, you know, if people were having trouble in their lives, she was the one that, that went in to see, uh, you know, even if we were just talking to people, just helping oh, people right. out. So she's like a psychotherapist, psychologist or just... I, 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 I don't know whether it would go that far, but she, she did, she, she basically has a load of experience of just going into to people and and seeing what you know how they, how they might yeah well that's the great thing is like th- they don't <laughs> have those kind of people don't have to have a fancy name for what they do I, exactly and they actually yeah. help people yeah. so that's your mom and dad and uh, siblings um, my brother sadly is no longer with us um, sorry to hear that he was three years older than me Jeremy and um, yeah he chose to become a farmer and I chose to join the military, 
and I went off to uh, to war, and uh, he was the one that caught a bullet. So um, yeah. Do you mind telling what happened? Uh, no, not at all. Um, so he did a forestry diploma in South Africa and started managing a timber plantation in the Midlands in in KwaZulu Natal, which is the province that uh, my family are from. And, yeah, someone uh, set a fire in one of his plantations and they knew the protocol for that was the plantation manager has to go out and check the fire first before calling fire teams in. So obviously knew he was going to be on his own and uh, he called in the fire teams. The fire teams arrived, put out the fires, which had obviously been uh, set. They didn't just start on their own. And they were like, hey... Where's, where's Jeremy? And uh, couldn't find him, so started searching a bit more widely and found him face down in the road, about 200 metres down the road from the fires uh, with um, a couple of shots. Uh, just killed him outright. Uh, so he, he, he didn't suffer, but um, yeah, he was murdered um, on his farm in South Africa, which is not an unusual story, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But... Um, <coughs> You know, uh, f- for 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 my family, it's a it's a real story. It's yeah, just no, a statistic. Uh, so, uh, and do, yeah. do you guys have any idea what happened? Like, who was it? Or so they did end end up catching the two guys that did it because you know my brother did a lot of work in the local community, and uh, it was actually some people in in the community came forward and said we've we've heard a couple of guys. Um, talking big in town about how they they shot shot the bloke up on the farm. Uh, we'll put us in a tinted uh, a vehicle with tinted glass. We'll drive through the town. We'll point them out to you. So they caught them. They were the ones that did it. They went down for for murder. Um, uh, unfortunately, the police departments in South Africa don't really have the resources to investigate any further than that. But the speculation was that. Um, the motivation is the plantation my brother took over when he finished his diploma was making huge losses and uh, after five years in charge of it my brother had turned it around and it was making millions of brands of profit and they suspect what happened is he with the sound management that he put in place shut down a uh, timber smuggling operation that the labor foreman was running. Uh, so they think the go. labor foreman put in on a hit, a hit using some of the local hoods. And, you know, off the back of apartheid, with all the political struggle, yeah. there, there were plenty of... Uh, violence is not unusual. It was obviously fairly easy for him to find some guys with a gun who would be willing to do this sort of thing. And they suspect that that is... What happened? Uh, he, uh, the foreman put in a hit. He obviously knew the the uh, procedures for the plantation. Yeah, so set a fire. Set He'll a fire. come out on his own in the middle of the night, and um, um, you know, p- justice kind of f- is served in the long run. The two guys were caught and went down for murder for it. And uh, I think the the labour foreman has since died of AIDS. So you know. Um, it doesn't bring my brother back, but yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's kind of case closed, if you like. Yeah, sorry about uh, getting to that uh, straight away. <laughs> no, no, back. it's uh, you, you know you, you didn't know about it. It's it's not something I advertise. Um, you know, if people do ask me about my family, um, you know, I, I did have a sibling. I grew up with a brother. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was your only brother. Was my only brother, but uh, now I, I I am an only child, but. Uh, uh, I didn't grow up that way. Um, yeah. That's, um, what is the city again? You, where you guys grew up? Uh, Durban, Durban. Durban. Yeah. And uh, what's uh, how bi- what's the population in Durban? Uh, it's it's a few million. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a decent size. Uh, and were you city. guys like central outside the? So outside? we were inland by about thirty kilometers, and mm. yeah. We, so we were in a suburb. It's a lot more built up than when we grew mm. up. I mean, when we were uh, when I first remember the house, we were like one of maybe five houses on our road. Now there's probably 30 houses and no no empty lots. But there were a lot of empty lots when we were kids. So, yeah, I mean, we we lived on the edge of a reserve and it's still a, a conservation area. So our suburb kind of meets onto this wilderness area. 
and we had monkeys stealing fruit off our table. Oh, shit. When we ran down the driveway, uh, when we got dropped off after school, we had to be careful and watch out for snakes crossing the driveway. Wow. And if you saw a snake, you literally had to freeze because you know, otherwise the snake might go for you. Oh, is that what you have to do when you see a snake? So Yeah, they go for movement. So if, if you Just like with a bear. <laughs> we don't get bears in South Africa, so you know more about. But them this than me. is the thing, like you know, I'm 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 huge fan of Rogan's, and he always talks about bears and stuff and hunting yeah. and stuff. And then when they say, "Well, this massive bear bears is approaching you, and you have to play dead yeah. or play still," yeah, yeah, I'm like, not in a fucking million years. Oh, mate, I don't know. I would run. I would fuck it. I would run still. It, it, it would take some balls to do yeah, that, wouldn't it? Or just just you know, piss it would be going down my leg. Well, I uh, suppose if if you kept familiar with it, because so when I left high school, my first job was in an adventure center, and uh, it was a little bit further out of the city in more of a wilderness area called the uh, Shongweni uh, Reserve, and there they had even bigger wildlife. They had buffalo and rhino and v- wildebeest and zebra and giraffe and and all the rest of it, and they had cobras and mambas and and all sorts on there. Black mamba. Now, I worked there and I got so familiar with, with the surroundings and the wildlife that I clearly remember walking down one of the tracks uh, where we all lived and heard some rustling on the side of the road. I was just like, okay, if I stay still, I'll I'll hear what this is. So I just stopped mid-stride so my legs were apart and I saw over the lip of the road, which was about shoulder heights uh, off on the side of the road, uh, a Mozambique spitting cobra came over the edge of the road and I was just like, oh, I'll just stay still. And I didn't move, it didn't see what I was, and it just crawled all the way down, straight between my legs, straight up the other side of the road, and away. It was just like, that was cool. How did that feel when it was right between your legs? Oh, it was just like, I better not move right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's too late there. Ooh. It's too late there. It's like, well, I'm going to wait till it gets to my leg, and then I will move. Exactly. Oh, mate. that's yeah, crazy, that, that, that would have been a silly thing to do. But, uh, yeah, I mean, they, they're dangerous. We did have... Uh, I was chasing once uh, a poisonous... In Latvia, we have two poisonous um, um, uh, snakes. Yeah. And I remember we would go... It was with a kindergarten day out, with all the kids walking around. Yeah. Like, walking down, you know, for what. And I would see a snake and I would start chasing it. I would literally, the snake goes in a bush and I go after it. Then teacher almost lost her shit. <laughs> She's like, Renaris, what are you doing? Get back. I was like, no, but teacher, look, it's cute. Like, I, I'm not afraid of snakes at all. Yeah. Um, I love, I uh, mean, like cuddling the bone constrictors or whatever they call yeah, them, the yeah, pythons. Yeah. But obviously I would be probably different if I know that's a ven- venomous snake, yeah. Yeah, look, um, uh, I have... Particularly in South Africa, I have a healthy respect for snakes. Um, both of my parents were, were really good with them because occasionally we'd get snakes in the house at home and uh, they showed us how to handle them and catch them and all the rest mm. of it. So That's cool. You need to, you I need wouldn't to know that stuff. Yeah, I, w- I wouldn't say I'm afraid of them. I am wary of them. Yeah. Like if I saw one, I would be careful. Yeah, particularly yeah, yeah. If You're not going to pet them. W- well, yeah, uh, a couple of our dogs almost died when they uh, decided they were going to have a go at a puff adder um, in South Africa, which is um, a rarely venomous snake. It's got a cytotoxin, which, um, you know, the, 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 so the cobra is a neurotoxin that gets into your nerve system and shuts down your, oh, your lungs and your, your sight and all the rest of it. So nasty what's stuff. It, what's it called? <coughs> <laughs> John is dying here, just so yeah, you guys know. Diseased, yeah. Well, he's trying to convince me it's not COVID. It's just uh, <laughs> he got cold from uh, one of his uh, daughters. Is it you both daughters you have? Yeah, I think it's both the girls. Yeah. Oh, you think you're not sure? <laughs> it's, well, well, I think my daughter's diseases that she brings back from nursery are worse than COVID, to be honest. But there you go. Like, you're gonna get vaccinated for that shit? No, you can't. I you just to. don't have kids. Um, so uh, yeah, the uh, the cobra's uh, toxin is a neurotoxin, mm. so it shuts down your nerves. Um, and the puff adders is a cytotoxin, so it attacks the flesh. Puff adders. Do they look puffy or something? So uh, the adder is a s- you get a species of adder in in the UK black adder. Um, so yeah, uh, but uh, I don't think it's particularly venomous. I think it maybe is painful if it bites you, but the puff adder and gaboon adder in in South Africa. Uh, so a d d yeah that that that's the one yeah there you go. I love Google that it can just you kind of type it in <laughs> auto correct yeah, yeah and yeah. something comes out yeah there you go looks very like the um. 
the rattlesnake. Yes, yeah, very very similar kind of um, uh, patterning, I suppose you could say, with the scales. Um, Sexy as fuck. So these guys are nasty. Uh, if if they bite you, um, it's it's a world of hurt because basically their uh, venom uh, kind of dissolves the flesh. Oh my god! So if they bite you on the leg, like an area around that, depending on how badly you get bitten, will just kind of die and fall off. Oh god! Um, and of course, if that gets gangrenous or something like that, it'll just kill you out. So right. then, if this this fucker bites you, is it done, or the, if you do very quick, this antidote or well, something? Well, like both that? of our dogs survived. So so look, it's uh, I suppose it would depend on where it bit you. <laughs> so what about the human? So the it get it's like literally uh, bites you on the leg. Uh, y- you you would lose a part of your leg like no matter what so like no matter how fast is going to be the help or yeah antidote or anything uh, i like mean that. if 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 you got there soon enough but uh, yeah basically the 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 toxin kills the flesh around that bite Jesus wound Christ. so it's uh, it's it's yeah it's horrible stuff you don't want to get bitten by one of those yeah. Hell, you wouldn't want to get bitten by a cobra the, the most dangerous either, thing i grew up with in latvia was uh, shitty booze <laughs> there you go <laughs> drink those yeah. too much you're gonna fall fall off yourself yeah i mean look, look if you scroll down again look at that guy's uh guy's arm on the right hand side over there on oh that's what it is ew yeah yeah is so that gonna fall off so uh, I suppose it depends on how badly he was bitten, but uh, you know our dogs were bitten on the face, oh God. and uh, the concern from the vet, <coughs> um, he was actually worried that uh, you know, he basically had to, he sliced open the whole cheek, let the skin flap down, when the uh, dead tissue had turned black, he scraped it all off until he could only see pink living flesh. Then he flipped the the skin back on so that it would then grow back over. His worry was that uh, our dog had lost so much of her jaw muscle that she wouldn't be able to chew food. Fortunately, the, there was enough jaw muscle left there for her to, to carry on using <laughs> I her thought jaw. you were going to say, not enough jaw muscle for a dog to have the jaw dropped. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. so, it's like every time you say a joke, the jaw just goes, uh. oh, it's because I'm missing some muscle. That sounds yeah. like very intricate plastic su- surgery there. <laughs> yeah, the vet was really good, actually. Uh, what was his name? Angus. Um, Angus, shout out to Angus. Yeah. What's up? Yeah, <laughs> he was really good. Yeah, you can send send link to to Angus that we we talking about him. Well, uh, South Africa. Do you think South Africa is crazier with uh, wildlife than Australia? Or is it, is it quite similar? Um, what about they, the um, completely different? I, I think Australia is known for its just wildly venomous uh, like spiders, isn't it? Spiders and Black snakes and, and, and things. Um, it, it's just got really different animals. Um, I mean, South Africa has got. Africa's got some pretty good uh, venomous things, but uh, I think Australia, because Aus- Australia, you've got venomous things in the water. You've got the blue ringed octopus, mm. which just you know it wants to bite you and kill you, and then you've got um, you know various venomous sea snakes and uh, saltwater crocs. Crocs. Yeah. yeah. Cro- crikey. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's mental, man. That's uh, cool. Okay, so that's the wildlife in South Africa. <coughs> I mean. Um, you know, when I, anytime I meet someone from South Africa, one of the main subjects is going to be the violence and shit was going on in South Africa. Yeah, you don't hear much about wild uh, uh, the the w- wilderness and in, in nature. It's mainly yeah. about the humans and and you know our podcast started with unfortunate uh, story about your brother, but like I think one of the girls I met and uh, she was on the set working with us. Yeah, the yeah. last job we did, which we're not allowed to mention. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so and she, I don't know if I told you, told told her about her. So she moved uh, away from South Africa. She basically ran away. Yeah. Uh, she comes home uh, with her husband. And whether they already were there, the burglars, yeah. or while they were at home, so her husband got killed in front Ish. of her, fa- like literally in front of her, and she got stabbed, but she survived. She's a big girl. I'm pretty. I'm sure. I'm. I'm yeah. hoping that she picked up the fight, or whether she ran away. I'm not really sure. And then I've, uh, we have other friends. We have Alex Brack, who is yeah. uh, from uh, South Africa, and he tells the stories. I'm like, what the fuck. And I mean, uh, yeah. you know, I, I check like the history is quite crazy and like what was going on. And, you know, anyone who d- wants to know more about South African history is like uh, can follow the uh, um, uh, long. What is the what was the uh, name of the book? Uh, of the book? Mandela's Long Walk to Freedom. Yeah, Long Walk to Freedom. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I didn't know much about South Africa. And when I when I read that book, I was like, I was quite uh, 
you know, I thought it was crazy. Well, we were dealing with our shit back in Latvia or, or Eastern <laughs> Europe, you know, yeah. communism. It was about the same that. time, wasn't it? It was about the time. Uh, yeah, uh, because he was looking up to Stalin and the communists. Yeah. Because he was thinking that, you know, these guys know their shit. <laughs> yeah, they know. They kill a lot of people yeah. with famine and all sorts of crap. So, yeah, yeah, it's like... But also, like, you know, you kind of understand, and, and I tr- do try to understand Mandela's side because you can see, like, the... Uh, unfairness what was going on and for years and years and they need you know something would happen eventually yeah um how do you how do you look at that uh, situation like do you think mandela had his kind of do you do you like what do you say you supported what mandela did or not really or well look um hey <coughs> when people are put in really difficult situations uh what is justified and what isn't mm. um that's you know, good that's a good i uh, i trained to be a soldier and i went to war and you know if if you go to war you do things which wouldn't be considered justified in everyday life yeah, yeah of course um so you know in south africa racism was legal mm. and you know, if I put myself in the shoes of a black person, I mean, Trevor Noah is great to listen to about what it was like growing up as a black person in South Africa. Uh, not just because he puts a uh, comic or spin on it, you know, it's, it, it is entertaining to listen to. Trevor, he, is he a comedian? He's a South African comedian. He took over the Daily Show in the States from John Stewart. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know, Trevor. I know, yes. You, uh, read He's his amazing. book. Read his book, mate. It, it, he will give you the insight into what it was like growing up uh, yeah, yeah, a, as a black kid in South Africa. And you know, I grew up on the other side of that barrier. Do I agree with what Mandela did, which got him put in prison to start off with? Well, I think he was going to blow up... He, he, he was going to blow House of Parliament up or something like that. He, he was basically going to blow things up in a what would be viewed from the white South African perspective as a terrorist act. Mm. But, you know, um, so is that right? I mean, other, other freedom fighters have achieved things through peaceful means. You know, Mahatma Gandhi... Um, uh, Martin Luther King in in the states, um, but it, you know e- even there those those struggles are still ongoing. Um, I uh, I think it's easy to look at the past and particularly South Africa. It's a really difficult thing because if I were put in the same situation as a lot of the people doing a lot of the things that they did, Mm. I probably would have done exactly Mm. the same thing. So, um, yeah, that's the thing, like about anything in our lives, like whenever we, we lash on someone like, Oh, why did he or she did this and that? Yeah. And I always say like, try to be in their shoes. Yeah. Exactly. Try to find out about their background, their upbringing, the, the, the shit they had to deal with years and years. Yeah. And then let's see how you're going to act and react. Like one of the, you know, examples is like so many immigrants are trying to get to UK or or through France, like from Africa. And, you know, some of the snobs are like, "Um, so why they don't stay in their own countries? Go live in their country. Put yourself in their shoes. Exactly. And then we just, we're so lucky that, you know, uh, I was born in a tiny little country, you know, we had so our issues in back in the days, but now we have this freedom that we can yeah. go anywhere you anywhere. Fantastic. You know, it's like even even if it takes a little bit of figuring out the visas or whatever, but you know, European Union for us was just such a blessing to what, go. What a privilege for for us to to live exactly. in, this, in this place. And you know, in in, in terms of Mandela, uh, you know, uh, I think it's it's probably better to look at look at how he conducted the transition away from the legality of racism which was the end of apartheid and he could easily have been very bitter he could easily yeah. have sowed discord but he tried to bring unity and if that is a message and a beacon that south africans can all work towards you know you've heard of it about the violent tragedies in my life that probably is a legacy of apartheid yeah, most likely. Um, all of the stories which you've heard from your friends those are a legacy of that system of uh, legally oppressing 
other races inside your country and that legacy will come to an end and you know at, at present there's huge problems with corruption and uh, uh, you know there, there's still violent crime there's corruption um, at some point like people have to hold on to something bigger than that and say mm. You know, this is Mandela was a man that called for unity, that called for us to work together. If we work together, we can solve these problems. We can have a team that wins the Rugby World Cup if we work together. Yeah, um, I was just about to talk about that, that exactly film that. with Matt Damon. What did you? Invictus, so, so yeah. just to ask you quickly, uh, you read the book. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I read the book Invictus. Did uh, you read the? Uh, did you see the film? Uh, no, 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 not to, uh, uh, about Mandela. Long, long road to freedom. Long is it? Long road. Yeah, Sorry, I, I bought it, but I, I must say you never I, read I it. didn't actually ever read it. I, yeah. I read it twice, and then I watched the film. Yeah, and it's as usually the problem is like it's so difficult to put whatever is in a book to put in a film. Yeah. Um, did you see the film? I didn't. know. You didn't see no. the film either. I was just wondering, like, to see like how uh, factual. You know that yeah. actually was, and how the the, tr the the reality what they were showing in the film or in the book. Yeah. Uh, but did you see the Matt Damon film then? I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, yeah. One out of Hollywood. three. <laughs> yes, we got it. Yeah. Uh, what did you think about film, and how real was it? Uh, having lived through through all of that, um, you know, I, I can't talk to what was happening behind the scenes. Yeah. But um, what was the f uh, title of that film? <coughs> Excuse me. That's all right. Invictus, so... Invictus. Yeah. There it is, yeah. I thought it was amazing. I cried, man. Yeah. I think there was like two or three p points where I just like... I was bawling, man. These they, they did a great, so beautiful. great job of dramatizing it. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's always now what the question cost. is... Samuel L. Jackson and Matt Damon. I mean, yeah. brilliant. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, as a South African... What do you mean Samuel Lee Jackson? Isn't that Samuel L. Jackson? Was it Mandela? Samuel L. Jackson playing him? I think it is, yeah. No. No, no not Samuel L. Jackson. It's uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan I'm Freeman. Sorry. Here you go. Yeah, 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 I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get that one. Can oh, you imagine come that, on. that bad, bad mouth there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to play a president? <laughs> hey, motherfuckers. <laughs> motherfuckers, motherfuckers, motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, Morgan, Morgan Freeman. Freeman yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, my apologies. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, so... Yeah, I, I think they did a pretty good job of of dramatizing it. I mean, <laughs> we watched the uh, the their uh, action of the the rugby bits of it, and I mean, as a rugby player, you could be, yeah, you don't, don't yeah, want to watch yeah. it. It's not about that, obviously. but it isn't about that. It's yeah. it's about um, actually choosing not to be um, choosing not to take revenge on yeah. the other side and being the bigger man. Yeah, and man th that's th that's what mandela achieved yeah. i mean uh, and the result of it is 12 years later south africa came back and won the world cup again with even more black players in the side who had watched the 95 world cup final and thought that's hang amazing. on a minute chester williams is in that team i can be a part of that and then come to the 2019 world cup and even more black players and it's like the whole nation has you know, before the end of apartheid, it was a white man's sport, really. There yeah, were yeah, some yeah, black yeah. and colored players, but... Because in the film, far. they were showing that like black, all the black people were laughing, like, me, playing what? What's going to happen now? And and now, you know, come 2019 and Sia Khaleesi, what a story for him. I mean, you, you look into Sia Khaleesi's background. Mm. Man, th that, that kid couldn't afford shoes. He couldn't afford to, to feed himself. He he managed to get to one of the local schools and impress um, at at like tryouts, and he was sponsored to come into the school, and that's where he first got rugby boots and sports kits. And Sia Khaleesi, I mean, I'm not familiar. No, he's Please tell he, me. he was the captain of the World Cup winning side. Right. Uh, so he's he's the ca current Springbok rugby captain. So you know you c you can draw a line from that back to Mandela being the bigger guy and saying. Yeah. I'm not going to take revenge on on mm. the Afrikaners, on the architects of apartheid, mm. by taking away their symbol, their their enjoyment, their rugby sport. I'm going to embrace it and make it something that all South Africans can get around. And the result is, you know, 30 years later, South Africans are winning more World Cups, 
but as a you know as it's something that we can all unite around awesome this is our first part okay yeah. we're gonna move to Take our next break. segment in a second and we're gonna have a little break brilliant but i think there was a really good ending in the first half i think so yeah <laughs> John Slayer, that's the uh, name I thought is your real name. And I found out it's not real name. What's going on with the Slayer situation? Tell me, please. So, yeah, my uh, the, the, the Slayer name is basically an abbreviation of my actual name, which is, is up there. And, well, if people try and pronounce that, they, they tend to pronounce it wrong. And then if I pronounce it to them and they haven't seen it spelled before, they usually spell it wrong. So I just thought I'd make it simpler for everyone. And my so my equity name for stunts, and I was making documentaries before. Mm. Um, uh, I just abbreviated it to, to Slayer, which most people mispronounce it as Slayer. So it seemed like a natural progression. Because, yeah, if, you, if I would see this, I would try to say Slayer, but it's not. Yeah. How do you say it? Schleier. Yeah. Schleier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think it's uh, it's Austrian in origin, I believe. It's like liar, uh, just put sh- esh in front, <laughs> schleier. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Easy. Yeah. I wouldn't struggle with that, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, documentaries, hold on. What kind of documentaries are you talking about? So I was, yeah, y- you, n- you know the background with, uh, with my old man being a, uh, a coral reef marine biologist. So when I left the military, which was back in 2008, I had money in my pocket and time in my hands and just ended up scuba diving around the world. And I was basically trying to set myself up as a underwater cameraman for natural history productions uh, which in the end le- led on to to things like w- what you've got up on the screen at the moment but uh, uh, i he's referring to 360 bubble deep because a lot of people are going to be listening this <laughs> yeah John. yeah Come we on, go. Man. so yeah it's uh, I started out basically just filming as much stuff as I could underwater to get my technical skills up to speed mm-hmm. so that I could actually be a competent underwater cameraman. Which Local pools, anywhere you could get in. Yeah. Pool and party, yeah, just to uh, film that. I, I was, I was, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like how he's just like ignoring it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what uh, are you doing? We're naked yeah. here. Like, we're trying to have a party. No, I just need to get experience. Let me get the camera angle right. <laughs> I'm just getting experience. <laughs> it's half a meter depth. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, so <laughs> mostly focusing on coral reefs <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> rather than naked bodies underwater, which maybe would have been more fun. That, that's a different kind yeah. of industry, though. <laughs> it is a different industry. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I traveled literally around the globe just filming underwater, Great Barrier Reef, um, Pacific, the Atlantic, um, Mediterranean Red Sea, and just got underwater and uh, did underwater camera work. And then started making little documentaries for, uh, you know, I met loads of scientists and conservationists that were doing good work, doing great research, but maybe didn't have a means of uh, distributing that or communicating that. Mm. So I, I tried to, to meet that need. Hold on, just I want to clarify something. So we can see, anyone who will see this video, you uh, underwater, filming, doing some cool stuff. And now... You, for a living, run around with plastic guns. <laughs> 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 just, just to clarify, is that... Wait, it's, it's good work. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not going to deny that. But it was funny because uh, actually a couple of days ago when we worked together, and it, I was the one who said that because I remember that uh, when I was in kindergarten back in Latvia, uh, we would run around kindergarten with these uh, AK-47 little dummies, like plastic guns, and yeah. we would just pretend that we're shooting each other and making noise and stuff. And look at this, 37 years later, <laughs> I'm doing this for we're a We're still living. in that place. Yeah. Well, I, I remember doing exactly that around our house in, in, in South Africa, running around playing cowboys and Indians. And, yeah. and bang, the, bang, bing, you're bing. dead. <laughs> 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 and you, you're quite right. You know, here we are, forty years later, and um, it pr- pretty much still. And they pay the pay f- pay for it, and, and it's actually pretty decent pay as well. Yeah, yeah, crazy. So um, some might argue we, we, th- there is a certain amount of skill to it, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot. Of, what are you talking yeah, about? There's a lot of skill to it. There's a lot of it. There is. Yeah, and then okay. Um, you did. Uh, we just kind of skip forward it. Uh, how long were you in the army now? The so forces. yeah, I mean, uh, chronology of it, the the time, th- the kind of timing was. So I finished high school yep. in 1994. I 
went straight into university to study a mechanical engineering degree, but realized kind of midway through first year that it probably wasn't what I wanted to do with my life. So midway through second year, I mm-hmm. finally made that decision. And Is it a four out. years program? Like it was a four-year master's program, and uh, I ditched it midway through second year and went and worked in an adventure centre because that seemed like far more the sort of thing I enjoyed. Wearing shorts and boots and talking about snakes. Uh, shorts and... No, no, barefoot, mate. It's Oy, Africa. Barefoot. Barefoot, uh, barefoot in the Especially bush. when there's a lot of poisonous snakes. <laughs> yeah. Puffer snakes and shit. Yeah, barefoot. Uh, uh, mate, I, I, I didn't wear shoes unless I cut my feet. If uh, So I was running around in, in a game reserve barefoot. Um, back then, and because uh, I, I just I, I preferred it, I far yeah. preferred being barefoot. Now when you get used to it, it's like I, as a kid, I grew up also bare feet running around. Yeah. And then now, when I was in Bali, I realized how I'm grown out of it. Yeah. And, and your feet toughen up. Yeah, yeah. And then I took uh, it took me time to get used to it. But then when I came back to UK, oh my god, I put the <laughs> shoes on. It's like what <laughs> is going so weird, on? Also, yeah. my toes got felt weird. Like they felt like they grown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they they're don't spread out. Yeah, they spread yeah. out. Yeah. And they say like again, I heard this in one of the podcasts. Uh, so they're talking about if you live for a very long time, like by generations, and you don't wear shoes, so you literally like your toes become more like fingers. Mm-hmm. You can like, actually yeah. grab stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, so that was me in in Africa, man, uh, running around barefoot, uh, running, uh, yeah, basically doing adventure center stuff mm. in a game reserve in South Africa. So, kayaking, rock climbing. And you did for how long you did you do that? So I did that for three years. Finished up there as the chief instructor, and basically the choices open to me then were at at the point where I was I was sufficiently skilled that I could either open up my own center mm-hmm. and so go to a different location and basically set up a, a similar sort of camp which my best friend ended up doing and he still runs his his camp up near Johannesburg in South Africa an excellent place and uh but I chose a slightly more adventurous route I'd really got into whitewater kayaking mm. at the time so I was like, I'm going to go up to Victoria Falls. I'm going to go to the Zambezi mm. River and I'm going to start working on the rivers as a safety kayaker for the commercial rafting outfits that run uh, tourists down the, the Zambezi River yep. below Victoria Falls. And then I'll just follow the season around the world. So I'll earn enough money to get an air ticket to the next river. And as the season starts there, I'll just travel around the world like that. <coughs> Well, uh, I, I hit the season too early and didn't quite work out. And I ended up about three months later back in South Africa, back at square one. But while I was out there, I ended up helping on a, a com- with a company called Absail Zambia that runs a gorge swing across the um, uh, Batoka Gorge below Victoria Falls. Fantastic activity. Mm. Really worthwhile doing. And um, Victoria Falls, where's that? Between Zimbabwe and Zambia. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, the largest waterfall in the world. Not the highest, but by far the largest. In what terms. is Ni- Niagara Falls? So Niagara Falls Niagara. is about, uh, I think it's uh, only about two-thirds of the height and about a third of the width of Why is of Niagara Falls so famous then? Uh, it's it, it's because it's it's far more visible. I mean, uh, you, you, you have to travel out your way to get to Victoria Falls. Uh, okay, it's um, easier to approach, basically. E- approachable. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's actually, when, when you get to it, it's, it's more visible as well. Because Niagara Falls, which I have been to as well actually opens out into quite a broad valley that carries on Mm. down afterwards so you can go and you can see it Um, whereas the Victoria Falls is like it's it's cut a rift into a plateau in the African wilderness and it literally is it's it's I think it's a mile and a half wide Mm. it's huge and when it floods that entire mile and a half is like five meters deep in water just plunging over the edge and it actually it makes the whole bedrock shake for miles around so you can rock you go into the local uh, villages when it's high water season yeah and if it's early in the morning and there's no traffic you're like you can hear this like shaking sound and oh like wow. what the hell is that and then it's like and you it's walk harlem shake it's it's the the shop <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the shop windows <laughs> shaking in their window frames oh, it's mental it's like <laughs> you you're a perfect person to ask this question so you know like in some adventurous films and i think mm. one of the last ones 
Was it was it uh, Jumanji? I'm not sure. So you know when they go in a boat and they fall, f- the uh, the waterfall is about to come, and then they yeah. fall in the water. Yeah. Um. Okay. Let's assume there are no rocks under there. How dangerous do you think is the whole thing of? So okay, like out of the boat, you can jump if you jump forward. Yeah. And then you jump away from the boat, so boat doesn't land on you. Yeah. So as long as you're that, you should be fine, right? Uh, How does it feel when... Because I haven't done much of a... i never done, actually, a waterfall jump. So if you fall with the water next to you, does it cushions your fall or it's... So, uh, yeah, it, it really depends on, on what, what's happening underneath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, whitewater kayakers shoot waterfalls all the time, but you've mm. got to hit the right spots. Yeah. You've got to make sure there's no rocks in the pool Oh, another the bottom. Uh, you hit the wrong spot. <laughs> uh, I think some people have actually survived being swept over Niagara Falls just in a life jacket. Really? Um, and, I mean, th- that's mental because it is. It's high. How high is it? Um, Niagara Falls, you'd have to check. I don't think it's... Uh, I know Victoria Falls is 110 meters high, but often Victoria Falls falls straight onto rocks. So if you fell off that, um, apart from the fact that there's just vicious white water at the bottom of it, Okay, um, you give me a guess before we open it. Oh shit! You, you I was going to guess sixty meters. So yeah, fifty-one uh, meters. That's a lot. So I vic- do ten meters for. I done twenty meters jump from, which is the highest in Bali. Yeah, in which I, highest I've done twenty meters. Jesus Christ! So look, if if you've got a, a plunge pool at the bottom of that, you you're not going to have any impact with water. Mm. But it's whether there's rocks in there and whether yeah, the plunge yeah, pool is deep enough that you're just going to travel with the flow of water mm. until eventually you. But the the bigger thing, um, you know, Niagara Falls, I think it's, you know, you can see there's actually quite clear water. Once the waterfall has fallen, there's actually quite a big lake beneath mm. that. Victoria Falls, all of that water is channeled into a narrow gorge, which has only got one outlet. So it's just churning white water for like a mile and a half wide. You don't want to fall on this shit. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I don't know where they've managed to fall know. over and actually survive because that looks vicious, doesn't it? <laughs> Um, rocks yeah so uh, yeah uh, uh, it's it's completely unrealistic something as as high as niagara or or victoria falls to go over that and consider you that you oh my god it's so beautiful yeah so it's it's oh. gorgeous but look at that gorge so it's just that narrow rift down through so oh. you think about all of that being in flood that entire face you know, that's that's the dry season. So you've just got these ribbons of water coming down. Yeah. But in the flooded season, that entire cliff is just solid water, three, four meters deep, just plunging over the edge. And actually uh, call it, um, in the local language, it's called Moziotunya, which is the smoke that thunders. And from tens, hundreds of kilometers away, you can just see this plume of vapor like mm. it looks like a cloud and it basically is a cloud of, of water vapor that's just churned up by the action of that waterfall so it's uh, and yeah you, you the smoke that thunders it does it makes the shop windows shake wow in the towns around it's it. very impressive incredible place well okay uh went yeah what happened how did you end up in the military then so the ab sailing company that i was working oh, on okay. that had the gorge swing across the gorge below victoria falls um had a consultant working for them who was an ex royal marine mm. and i'd never thought about joining yeah i'd never thought about joining the military let alone the how military. old you were then at the time i was so that would have been that was 1999 so it would have been 22 years old still super young yeah um and yeah, I'd never considered joining the military and he kind of saw what I was doing, helping manage a, an abseiling company on the side of the gorge, whitewater kayaking in my free time. And he just said, hey mate, you know, look, if, if you're at a loose end, why don't you give this a look? And uh, he put me in touch with the Royal Marines and I read the glossy br- brochures and was convinced by the, uh, yeah, I, I really didn't know what I was getting myself Their into. marketing. They, they got yeah, the, the marketing was good. Yeah. Um, what did the marketing say? Oh, Do you want to be real, man? Yeah, sound mind <laughs> and a sound body, you know, yeah. egalitarian elite, challenge yourself, challenge your mind, challenge your body. And, you know, it, it certainly did all of that. But I, I was naive and innocent. Uh, I, I really didn't know what I was getting myself in and for. And you end up being there for how long? 
So it it took a little while to to get in, um, but eventually I I came out to the UK in June of two thousand to do the selection courses to get into the Royal Marines. I did sufficiently well with those to get in as an officer, and joined in September of two thousand and. The training itself was 13 months. Uh, Royal Marine Commando training as an officer is longer than it is for for recruits. Uh, Finished up the training in September of 2001, three weeks after the World Trade Center attacks. And was that you? (laughs) That that could have been me back back then in the day. I yeah. think that's a very good marketing shot. Uh, it is a good marketing <laughs> shot. Man. Yeah, they have plenty of that stuff. Going you probably around. were more like these guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Look for the guy grumpy, covered in mud, and uh, looking like he's cold and threadbare. And that's it. Would uh, be so hilarious <laughs> if uh, we actually find a photo, photo of you. It it would be funny. Actually. <laughs> Look yeah. at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who let the short guy in? <laughs> it's yeah. like I don't want to be here. <laughs> oh fuck. Yeah, that, that that was me, man. It it, it genuinely it feels like another life because that was me for eight years. Yeah. Um, eight years. Yeah. So from twenty two s- till thirty. Yeah, pretty much. I left in uh, March of two thousand and eight, which was just short of, se- of eight years in, and yeah, so I would have been thirty one years old when I left, and yeah, that that's when I started scuba diving doing underwater camera work mm. with with the aim of getting into uh natural history productions you know i wanted to, you know david attenborough is something i grew up with and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he was the hero and i kind of wanted to to try and follow in his footsteps and get paid for going out and doing those cool trips where you get to see the wildlife around the world but did you want to be a person in front of cameras did you want to be the uh, uh, sa- the voice yeah you, you know I you don't strike me as a very like I enjoy talking to you. You're a very intelligent, interesting guy to talk to. But I don't you don't strike me as someone like who wants to uh, talk wants to be in front of the camera. Yeah. yeah. So it, for for me it was uh, I I could see it as a vehicle to be able to do the things which I really enjoyed mm. because the trick with all of this is yeah it's it's all great going on an expedition and doing mm. this and that and having all this fun, but how do you pay for it? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so the idea was. You know, get into the production. Yeah, if it if it requires it, be in front of the camera, and make a documentary, uh, develop those skills, so that then you can market that and create an income so that you can actually pay for these expeditions and yeah. go out and do these cool things. So that, that that was the intention, and yeah, I did get myself in front of the camera a lot of the time. Most of the time, I was behind the camera because I just enjoyed filming the wildlife, and. Uh, but yeah, but it, it just about worked. Uh, I had a storyline lined up for one of the Blue Planet films, the second series, Blue Planet oh Two. All right. Um, what happened? Did the snake get you? <laughs> yeah. No, it's uh, you know. Um, or then you went to see a John Wick, and he was like, "I want to be stuntman." <laughs> Well, uh, actually, it's, uh, it's it's a little bit more disappointing than that. I uh, w- we had the storyline lined up, and they were going to come and and uh, <coughs> travel out to a really cool uh, coral reef area with us to to film a storyline that uh, that I'd basically sold them on, and it was about eighteen months of paperwork, tennis, getting it all set up, and we were six weeks away from departing on the expedition. And the producer for that episode of of, uh, of Blue Planet called me up and just basically said, "Hey, look, I'm sorry, we've we've just filmed something else in in another part of the world. That's that's going to be a better storyline for us to follow for the series. So w- we're not going to do your trip." And it w- it was th- that kind of was the uh, the make or break point because I'd spent all my money by by that point. Right. I'd kind of gone broke a couple of times trying to pursue this, and it just became a question of you know this. This isn't going to pay for itself mm. in its current form. Uh, what else can I do that you know will still, excuse me, allow me the latitude to do the things that I enjoy, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but actually earn me a living? Yeah. And I think prior to that, um, I'd already discovered military film services, which got us as SPACs 
Uh, my first job was on 24 when it was filming in London in 2014. For those who don't know what SPACs means, that's a special... Uh, special action special extra. Special action extra. So you do a little bit more than just be voice-activated furniture in yeah, the background yeah, yeah. of a so shot. Run around with the guns and stuff. And you actually, some of them can move and uh, be in from ex-military. And that's, I think there's even a agency with their ex-military guys. Yeah, so that's, that's what I signed up to. W- yeah. One of my mates, ex-military mates, put me in touch with them. And uh, my first job, like I say, was, was on 24 when Jack Bauer, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, was was here mm. in the UK. And yeah, first day I tipped up on set, they were like, yeah, here's your nine mil, you're a CIA agent, and Kiefer Sutherland's coming in in a few minutes. And that was me, like, Kiefer Sutherland was there, Benjamin Bratt was there, we were doing this scene, I was like, hey, what, you know, people are getting paid to do this? And then I met some of the stunt guys, and they were like, yeah, we're doing this for training, and that for training, and then we're going to do this, and... Do you remember who was the guy you met? Uh, yeah, it was so Luke Tumble was on set there, uh, Dave, David Chung, yeah. and you know th- they were doing their training at the time to get onto the register, and I got chatting with them. Of course, Luke's an ex-Royal Marine as well, mm. and uh, you know, p- yeah, it was. Luke, we love Luke. He's an amazing character. Yeah, it's fantastic <laughs> performer. So <laughs> I, d- I wasn't going that way, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I don't know. They, they they made it sound like a good idea, and I did a little bit more research on it, and um, started training about six months later to see if I could uh, get onto the British Stunt Register as well. And it took the three and a half years of training, but um, eventually got there. And yeah, there's there's still a, a, a the great thing about the job is you know. If you put me in the water, I've got all the skills and I've mm. got all the experience. I've been in the water and working for, for 30 years. Close on 30 years now. Yeah, 1993, I got my scuba diving ticket when on my first job yeah. with my dad. So it's, it's yeah, almost What's 30 that, years Paddy? ago. Was Paddy? Paddy? Did you get a Paddy? I actually did Naui, uh, Naui open water with him oh, and then you know transferred that. to Paddy. It's it's like North American underwater instructor. Paddy, what does it stand, stand for, Paddy? Paddy is Professional Association Diving Instructors. Oh, okay. Um, so um yeah i um yeah I, I, that skill i've got in spades but all the other things are things which i still need to progress so my my martial arts and screen combat i still need to work on that <coughs> yeah me and john we were paired up only like a couple of weeks ago okay <laughs> let's uh, you hit me i fall and i hit you awesome let's exactly go. <laughs> but yeah i've i've learned to to horse ride uh, i want to learn to to drive cars in a way that can be used uh, in stunts on set. Here you are on, the, on a horse. Can't recognize you with that beard. That's me on a horse, yeah. Look, yeah. At, that, look at that Playing beard. Viking on, on the back of a horse last winter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. That, That's Rebel. That's that's the horse that I loan out from the local stables. He's he's a legend. He's He's been in a few uh, commercials and TV productions he has. He's more experienced than you. He probably is, yeah. <laughs> Why are you getting yeah. me this rookie in my Tell ass? Tell you what, he, he taught me how to ride, though. That that horse has got an accelerator and no brakes. Um, <laughs> he, he was a lot of fun to learn on. Uh, nice. Yeah, he, he really got me uh, got my skills up to stand. Before we get getting more into st- uh, talking about stunts, um, I want to a little bit more about scuba diving. So, for people, let's, let's start from the scratch. Like, for people who are considering to get into scuba diving... Um, and uh, s- I hear this more and more that, oh, if you're not claustrophobic, then scuba diving would be good for you or good idea. How often do you meet people who actually they're claustrophobic, like they don't feel comfortable in the, in the elevator, let's say, or like a, like a small mm. spaces, and then they get, s- get in a scuba gear and they actually do feel claustrophobic or they don't or... Yeah, it's it's not for everyone. I do know people who put that mask on, put the regulator in, and then go underwater. It's just too much. Mm-hmm. It feels too closed in. And it does. It, it restricts your vision a little bit. You've got something stuck in your mouth. You've got water all around you, so it messes something with your hearing Something stuck in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> talking about food, guys. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's not for everyone, but by the same token, it is something that you can very easily get used to. Uh, and actually become uh, for for me uh, scuba diving free diving it's it's almost a zen experience you know um, a charity that i work with uh, force blue we get special forces combat divers and we repurpose their skills when they leave the forces to be able to help in conservation and science and research projects <coughs> And they get underwater with me, and all of their scuba diving has been about going fairly shallow in the middle of the night, 
kicking like hell, get an insert onto a coastline, go and do something sneaky peaky, then jump back in the water, kick like hell to get to their extraction points, and then hop on a boat and disappear again. They never actually stopped to enjoy the wildlife or actually do it. The, the, being underwater was just a means to tactically get yeah, to an yeah, end yeah, for yeah. them. That's the, you're talking about the military stuff. Uh, about yeah, the military yeah. stuff. So th- then we we take them on this conservation project, this force blue thing, and uh, we get underwater. And, you know, after half an hour, you know, they've been down underwater. It's just like, wah, 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 breathing. <laughs> Do this down. Just, muscle, just, muscle. Like, just like John's showing. That's exactly what happened. And yeah. you're feeling like crazy. And, uh, you know, their air's gone after half an hour. And they'll come to the surface. And, like, 60 minutes goes by it's like where's John 80 minutes goes by yeah and then you know 90 minutes later John pops the surface they're like dude how did you stay down for so long it's just like dude stand out it's yeah. chill it's like the underwater environment for me is something uh, you put me in free diving you put me underwater and uh, everything slows down you actually get more done uh, you know uh, w- what's that saying about um Slow is fast and fast is slow. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if if you slow down, do things properly and that get them done story effectively story the first time around. Yeah. I always <laughs> rush. And then I'm like, you try to stick it. In. No. Yeah. No. And then you realize you just spend a lot of time. Yeah. No, nothing exactly. is done. So in in water, it's, it it very much applies. It's like um, if if you dial it back, you conserve energy and you actually use up less gas. You can do more. Um, stay down for longer and so on. It's a good, I can, <coughs> as a comparison is actually one of the sports which I'm being into, well, I've been out for a little bit because of my knee, but it's Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, BJJ. So yep. when you get rolling, as yep. soon as you start moving too fast and whatever, you gas out. And then the other guy can yeah. get the better And it's you. very yeah. similar like in scuba diving. Like, well, it's actually was my struggle when I started. I'd done only about 20 dives, so, you know, I'm not in a place to say yeah. I know much. But I know when I started, yeah, I, I uh, used my oxygen way faster. Yeah, yeah. And then my instructor would be like, yeah, just calm down, yeah. you know, be more mindful. Because also one of my biggest problems was buoyancy. I couldn't yes. get into buoyancy. I was like, my ass yeah. was sinking, yeah. was, my head was going up, and was like, what the fuck? And then, and then I realized that even if you just take a deeper breath, then straight away your buoyancy goes up. Yeah. So you have to find out that middle in between, just yeah. like in, out, and just and when it becomes normal and natural, then you, yeah, yeah. then it's it's easy. Um, but yeah, it's it's difficult to compare someone who's done how many dives you've done in your thirty years. I don't even want to know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. My, my, my first, so I did my open water course, um, finished it, and the very next day drove with my dad up the East Coast with a very experienced research team to film photo transects on the seabed. And basically what that involved, bearing in mind, rookie, zero buoyancy experience, was holding, so it was a coral reef. So you couldn't touch the reef. You, mm-hmm. you didn't want to break like corals and things. But you had to hold a, hold a frame, which like was like the reference frame for the photos, neatly in place on pre-positioned points over the reef with a grid above it where someone was holding a camera, which then took a picture of the grid from a particular distance. Otherwise, the measurements would be up. So we had one person at each corner of the frame. And just the sea conditions in South Africa are different. Like, um, yeah, because it's all on the continental shelf, you get waves coming in from the Indian Ocean. And when we were there, there was about a four meter surge on the bottom. So as the swell went overhead, you could feel it on the bottom at, you know, 15, 16 meters down. And the water would move four meters forwards and then four meters back. Mm. And then there was also a little bit of current up and down. Jeez. So me, rookie with no buoyancy, trying to hold a frame on a particular point just above the seabed, just there. Mate, the number of times that I just... Yeah. The whole... How many dives you had before that? Uh, Literally, I'd done my open water course. And I went out and did that. And I tell you what, mate, by the end of that week, my buoyancy was spot on mm. like nailed it but man it, it was like trial by fire because visually if you look at scuba diving it looks boring as fuck and looks as simple yeah. oh what a good top yeah when you see a skydiver is you have yeah. some like a different approach oh yeah skydiving that's a yeah. different it's so much more dangerous and all that stuff i think well i've done about 100 jumps doing yeah. skydiving 
And uh, I compare scuba diving, it's like a slow motion of skydiving. Yeah, yeah. So when yeah. you, but like super slow motion. Yeah. It is, yeah. So when you jump out of the plane, you go like, what? Uh, like uh, uh, about a minute to free fall and you pull. There's like, it's like everything is just yeah. so slow and, and peaceful. And um, yeah, and I think as soon as you figure out your buoyancy, for someone who doesn't know what buoyancy is, can you define it, please? Uh, it's, it's, it. uh, so your buoyancy is uh, how you float. So if you're positively buoyant, you're going to float up in the water. So your movement is positive. If you're negatively buoyant, you're basically denser than the water. So you're gonna, gravity is going to make you sink in the water column. If you're neutral, which is really what you want to achieve with with being underwater, then you're just going to stay steady at the same elevation in the water all yeah. the time. So w what problem is for people, they would think, oh, I'm sinking. Oh, I need to get the, my buoyancy up so you can release the oxygen in your equipment. Yeah. And then you release too much and then all of a sudden you're flying up. Yeah. And then you need to get rid of it and you're like, oh, you just end up yo-yo. Yeah, and then you just down, basically up go up and, up and down, down like yeah, a dumbass. Yeah. Okay, this is our second se segment. Let's have a break. Cool. The, um, scuba diving. Scuba, scuba diving. Um, so it was quite easy for you to get into because of your dad. Was he the one who introduced you? In yeah, diving? so, uh, I mean, I was the one that asked to get into it. I mean, it, it, was, it was right there in front of me because you know, I, my playground as a kid, whenever I went with my dad to work, was the... Now, there's a new SeaWorld in Durban. It's called Ushaka Marine World, but previously it was SeaWorld Durban, and it was this kind of 50s, 60s era building, which was just this maze of just kind of a building that had kind of evolved by itself and just got built on and built on. And, and there were basements and tunnels. And this was our playground. There were shark tanks mm. and ocean tanks, massive sea turtles, dolphins, seals, penguins, sharks, swordfish, sawfish. I mean, just the, the whole lot. It was just, a, as a kid... And then to have the beach and the surfers and all the rest of it. And then we had this this crazy playground, me and my brother, where we could just run around and explore this maze of just marine fascination. And uh, my dad, originally when he was working there, you know, he, he worked on various other things before he got into coral reefs. Like I remember going on... Uh, when I was in primary school, he was working on uh, researching how to manage the oyster fishery. So mm. in South Africa, the oysters are on the, the sea rocks by the shoreline, and you get teams driving in four by fours along the beaches. They'll stop at a set of rocks. Workers will go in the water, and they'll just shell oysters straight off the, the sea rocks. They don't trawl for them in South Africa. Oh, and trawl. I actually <coughs> learned about that from the books you suggested. Uh, That's where they were talking about trawling. Yeah, yeah. And the trawling, uh, explain to me quickly what a trawling was. Tr trawling, you, you drag... You drag uh, the... Drag a beam. For, for oysters, you drag a beam along the bottom, which would then scrape the oysters off the seabed. And also they fuck up the whole thing, Absolutely. Yeah. It, it, it is probably the most destructive uh, collection practice uh, on the planet in terms of... Because, yeah, like the corals, everything gets destroyed. Absolutely. And I'm presuming it's like a very strong, like a, some massive chain or something. Oh, It gets yeah, dragged uh, down the... Down I mean, the look, it, it depends on what they're fishing for. So, uh, I mean, they, they absolutely... Uh, uh, a, a good example is... Um, and, you know, you, you read that book, The Unnatural History of the Sea. A good example is uh, the oyster beds off off the eastern coast of the United States or um, you know h here in the English Channel and uh, oyster reefs basically used to keep the seawater clear because they circulate so much water and filter the crap out of it that uh, it eventually becomes clear and things like the Potomac River through um, Washington DC used to run crystal clear because mm -hmm. it was just beds of oysters but then we came along and basically trawled all the oysters up eventually uh, basically the oysters create their own reefs so the the shells fossilize and the new oysters grow on top of those and eventually yeah. you get a hard bottom which isn't silty or muddy and you get the oysters themselves circulating the the, the water so they keep the water clear yeah. 
and that's what happened here in the English Channel. Um, you know, basically they trawled, and each time you trawl for oysters, you scrape away a layer of that fossilized shell, and eventually you break through it to mud underneath, and then you're just churning up mud, and you're catching. I don't know, what do they catch? No, clams and things like this. You're basically catching the dregs of the environment that you've scraped away from. Um, and now they're fighting to continue catching those dregs instead of thinking of returning the um, environment to what it was, how prolific it was. And how long would it take them to go back to normal? That's like... So, uh, I mean, they've, they've got a project in New York at the moment called uh, the Billy, Billy and Oyster Project where they're aiming... So the waterways around Manhattan Island, again, are, are cloudy. They never used to be. Back back in the day, they were, they were crystal clear rivers. And the, the idea is um, to reintroduce a billion oysters which will then start self-propagating their own reefs and return yeah. um, to to what it used to be because that's nature's own filtration system and uh, so you know that kind of gives you the idea and the scale I, I don't know exactly how long that project has been going on for but they're pretty close to it I think when I visited them they had something like 600 million oysters that they'd reintroduced mm -hmm. to the seabed so these things are possible. They do take time, but uh, a lot of these uh, systems, which perhaps um, you know, fossilized oyster beds might take longer, but if you're tra trawling a different uh, substrate type, <coughs> they actually don't take that long to bounce back substantially. Some of the systems, like you know, uh, living corals, particularly the deep sea versions, because you don't just get tropical coral reefs. You deep get deep water corals which also form reefs but which grow far more slowly without the assistance of sunlight so they are filter feeders right. they get um, a bit like sea anemones they get all their nutrition just from catching water with their tentacles out of the water column and those cor uh, corals in the extremely oxygen deprived uh, completely dark deep ocean abyss they take a lot longer to grow, but they also live incredibly long. I think the oldest dated uh, deep sea coral is something like four and a half thousand years old. Um, and they form reefs as well. But of course, one trawl can absolutely destroy that. And uh, whenever, whenever you talk about like deep water <laughs> stuff, I always <laughs> think about this. Picture the anglerfish, yeah. As, yeah. A, as a kid, I remember I found this like little kind of a, a, a picture book or whatever, yeah. and they were showing these old creatures who live very deep in the water. I couldn't believe that that's a real thing. It's mental, I'm isn't like, it? like, look at this. You know, the sex life of these things is absolutely mental as well. So that is a female anglerfish. Do fish. tell me, please. So, so that that is a female anglerfish. So, um, How did you know it is by lips? Because they're pretty. No, because <laughs> because it, it's big and looks like a fish. The male fish is so... Uh, focus... Uh, go to go to the back, back end of that fish. Back so, end of the fish. So the, the next one along, the picture that you had up originally. So This one? No, the, the next one along. No, no, the, yeah, that, that one. So make yeah. that big again. Yeah. So you see where that's, uh, where its tail is? Yeah. You see a little fin underneath the tail? Yeah, this that, one. That might actually be the male. Oh. So what happens with these, these fish is that it's, it, it can be so rare for them to encounter each other in, in, in the deep ocean because there's just so much area for them to actually uh, explore and uh, there's so few of them. If a pair finds each other, the male will actually just bite onto the female and becomes a parasite. So then it starts living off, off her, like it's a bit like a tick. So it bites on, but it then, it, it, it never lets go. It basically- It's like a human life. It kind of gets absorbed into the female's <laughs> body. So it, it, it just like uh, becomes part, and becomes part of, of the body. female. So the male is, is just like, he's like a little parasite. He, he'll be about the size of that tail, just kind of flapping about. And So then the f male is much smaller. The male is, is well, th they might find each other when they're both like kind of juvenile and he'll just latch on and then she'll grow into a, a full size. God, fish. and how big is the, how big do they go? I, 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 they look pretty pretty terrifying. I don't think they actually get that big. Yeah, they're because, quite small. I mean, the, the deep sea is, is actually... 
Uh, like it's I tough say, to get gains there. Well, exactly. <laughs> uh, un- unless you get a whale that dies on the surface and sinks Look to the this bottom. Fucker. Uh, what is that? Uh, Pinocchio shark or something? Yeah, uh, mate. That that one next to it is even even crazier. What this one? Look to the left of that. This one. This one. So what? this thing has a transparent head. <laughs> That's a freaking you alien right there. So it lives where there's just just a tiny bit of sunlight reaching down through the water column. So probably about 400 meters down. Wow. And its eyes can face forward, and you can see it's got two little lenses on the front of its head for looking forwards. But upwards, it's got these like light magnifiers, and so it can look up through the top of its head to see if there's any prey that's like drifting down that's died and falling down and then it'll snap that up and eat it so it's got a transparent seriously you changed this cool stuff for running around with the fake guns yeah well done John well done (laughs) yeah but uh, at at, at least running around with the fake guns pays for it pays the bills (laughs) what was this one this is very Uh, the blobfish blobfish it it, it gets a raw deal man because uh, when it's when it's underwater at depth and it's got all that water pressure on it it doesn't look anything like that it's nice and nice and sexy they, they catch them and uh, basically it's its whole body just kind of um, yeah because that doesn't have that pressure anymore it exactly it, together. So it just kind of it's like wearing a bra and then you don't wear a bra yeah i, I know it's about exactly that exactly the same yeah, thing yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah. In your case is more like car set <laughs> <laughs> all that amazing craft in the, in the, on the jobs oh mate it's been so good that doesn't look real uh, don't oh think god look at this guy <laughs> jeez okay um yeah talking about the sharks and all that stuff so um first of all w- how dangerous and which are the sharks which are dangerous uh when you scuba dive oh I- any shark is dangerous if it bites you yeah so what is the how do what are the reasons why would they attack you uh, well a- a- attack is you know if if anybody who, who actually knows sharks well th- th- that's the first thing they'll say is has a shark actually attacked you or uh, take for instance a, a great white shark yeah a great white shark in murky water now you and i if if i walk up to something and i'm like oh what's this oh what am I using to manipulate that? I've got these wonderful things on the end of my arms. I can play with that. I can figure out what it feels like. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know that that's a cap. I can tell. This is a sex talk you're working on now. So, so <laughs> <laughs> how does it feel like when you touch that? So, great white shark. Yeah. If he f- finds he's in murky water, he's like, oh, uh, I, you know, they've got these uh, lateral lines which run down their body, which pick up vibrations in the water. He's picking something up. He's like, oh, what's that? Oh, okay. What's it's he more gonna of curiosity, d- isn't he, it? He's going to take a little nibble and go, oh, wh- what's that? Mm. Now, yeah, if, if if he's got another sh- great white shark over there, he's going to have a little nibble and it'll be like, oh, yeah, get off me. But if it's a bloke like you or me, that little nibble is going to take an arm or a leg off. And then he's going to go, that doesn't taste like seal. <sighs> There's no blubber and lard on that. I don't want that. Right. But you're going to be bleeding out in the water by this time. So, you know, was that an attack or was it a shark trying to figure out what was in front of it? So when you bleed it underwater, isn't that usually the blood what attracts sharks? So now once you start bleeding, maybe that's going to get, you know, some... Uh, because once once there's blood in the water, okay, now you're going to get actual hunting behavior out of a shark. But that initial, like, w- we don't... Sharks don't view us as food. We're okay. not something that they encounter in the water. But if they do choose to take an exploratory bite of you or I, and it's a bull shark or a tiger shark or a, or a, a great white shark, um, it's, it's probably going to be a fatal event for us. And it's just going to be, oh, that didn't taste good from the shark. But if they did try the taste and they're like, mm, not good, mm, actually pretty good. And then next time they see another human swimming and so, s- yeah. smelling that blood again and they're like they would attack and would they become a like uh, uh, hey it's it's possible that a, a shark could become habituated to to eating people um, oh, okay. yeah but you can't discount that that possibility but most of the time sharks get a really bad rap and actually um you know i've i've been diving numerous times with um uh bull sharks tiger sharks um uh, white tip sharks, um, any number of different species of sharks, and really haven't at any point in any of those encounters felt unsafe. Uh, But uh, again, I haven't encountered any of the sort of behavior which might make me think twice about being in the water with them. Because there are, 
um, you know, it's it's um, little signs and and signals um, that that the animals will give off if they actually are going into uh, a more active or, or hunting mode. Mm. And it's at that point that you'll probably say, actually, I know shark behavior. I'm not feeling safe anymore. I need to get out the water. But you're a pretty good source to, to give me a good idea in the future. If I do see a shark, don't freak out. Just yeah, uh, I mean, just th- chill. Th- that's that's it. It's it's like um, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those uh, films of uh tribesmen i think it's in kenya who steal meat from lions and lions will have made a kill and what they'll do is <coughs> they'll walk up as a group in hiding mm-hmm. until they're close to the lion feeding on their kill and then as a group they'll look at each other and go okay it's time and they'll all stand up and as a group they'll just walk Without flinching, without looking away, and the lion would find that straight at the lion, and the lion will, you know, he's like, "Hang on, these things aren't scared of me. This, this is this is not right." And the lion will push off, oh, okay. and then they'll take what they want from the kill, and then they'll push off. So then, the, how many people would be there in that group? So uh, I mean, you can find films of this, I think, on on YouTube and so on. I think it's uh, the the group that I saw was three people. Oh, okay. They just stand up, and so it's um, you know if uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> TikTok and Instagram and all the rest. Of it. I watched a video uh, the other day. I'm I'm not sure how legit it is, but of a. Um, uh, maybe it was an Indonesian or, or Malaysian uh, soldier who encounters a cobra and he just does this kind of wiggling thing with his foot where he kind of hypnotizes it with his foot and keeps it focused down. And then he raised his hand up like this, reached down, maybe it's a blind spot for the snake or something, got right down on top of the snake and he pushed its head, pushed his head, pushed its head and was kind of hypnotized all the way until he squashed its head on the ground um, and held it there, and then he grabbed the snake and, and lifted it up and then walked off with it. It's just like, how, how do you find out that you can do that yeah. to a cobra? <laughs> I mean, who's been doing that? How many people died? Well, but there are a lot of those. That? What they call them? They, they play music for, for yeah. snakes, snake um, yeah. whispers, so, or whatever they call them. I, I suppose the point is if, if you become that familiar with these, yeah. these animals, you, you, you know. When you can be there and when you can't be there. And humans definitely have blind spots as well. They certainly do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, More I've than we think. And w- with sharks, uh, I've I've uh, been underwater long enough and uh, with them to, to know when I can feel comfortable with them. And uh, at no point yet have I experienced uh, an encounter where I was like, okay, I need to get out the water now. What about punching a uh, shark in the nose? <laughs> you could, you're gonna love this. So, uh, one of the dives that I've done is off Adderwall Shoal. It's actually one of the local dives where I grew up uh, in Durban, and the the dive briefing is fantastic because it's basically y- you don't dive in a cave or anything. You 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 hopping in the water, and there'll be bull sharks, tiger sharks, reef sharks spinning around you the whole time. And they're just like this. So no, the, the shark might be curious. If it comes up and bumps you, all you need to do is just put your, your hand on top of the shark's head as it comes towards you, then push down and away. Push down and away. And you're just watching this thing going, a bull shark comes up to me. I just need to put my hand on his nose like he's a puppy and just push him down and away. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dive briefing, bro. And then, you know, an hour later, you, you're hopping into the water with, with the sharks. So, you know, um, yeah. But then you, you do hear the, the, the horror stories. Like, um, I mean, if, if you're stupid, you're going to get the results. Like, the, the one time we did a research trip up the northeast coast of South Africa, and we got up there. And it had been big in the news. A couple of guys had been eaten by sharks. And basically they'd gone out. They didn't come back up from their dive. They went out in a search party and all they found was basically a hand. That was, there's nothing else left. Uh, I think a bit of dive gear and a hand, everything else. So they just, they don't know what happened to them. But what these guys had been doing 
is you know you know you go on shark dives they'll take down a bin with like fish in it and so on and then they'll pull a line and the bin will open and the fish will go in the water and the sharks will mill about and you can swim with all these sharks and they go into a feeding frenzy but they're trying to feed on fish and you can watch it and be be safe these guys were taking tuna heads down in their dive vests and then like yeah puppy puppy come and take some food and Dude, I mean, that, that's that's, that's a Darwin Award waiting to happen. And, dude, it happened. It was just like they obviously didn't pull the fish out quick enough or whatever, and the shark just decided, hey, instead of biting for oh, the end of your stupid. hand, I'm just going to bite for you and, you know, blood in the water. That, did that, you, did that you see it. the Steve-O, the jackass, swimming with sharks? No, no, I haven't seen dude, this they, one. Dude, they would put a piece, of, a piece of tuna or whatever in their freaking Speedos Mate. and jump in there. <laughs> And swim with sharks. It's just not clever, is it? Oh my god! And 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 I remember there was this video. Uh, the shark just about to get him, like as he was getting out, got, getting in the boat. Uh, oh, those guys are crazy. <laughs> yeah. So okay, the sharks are not as dangerous as we think, and obviously, mm. it's all the films didn't really help uh, for this. But what is dangerous then? So some of the uh, sea creatures, ocean creatures, we have. Oh, I think the nastiest encounter I've had was uh, uh, getting skewered on a... So, lionfish. You've heard of lionfish lion before? Lionfish, yeah. So, I, I have been stabbed by What was the sign for lionfish? Oh, it's... it's. Is it this one? Is that lionfish? Isn't that a turtle? No, no a turtle is... Oh, turtle, turtle is, is like this that. one, yeah. yeah. I think this is lionfish. Yeah, so lionfish are really beautiful to look at, but yeah, um, they yeah. are a Indo-Pacific fish. They occur in the naturally in the Indian Ocean and Pacific Oceans, and somehow there's a lot of debate on how they were introduced to the Caribbean. And because they actually are, you know, if, if you look at that fish over there, the all of the dorsal spines, so the ones sticking up, st- sticking up actually have needle sh- needle sharp uh, spines in yeah, them. Yeah. And all of those spines are venomous. venomous then yeah. the, the feathery ones on the side, three of those spines are venomous. And then two of the anal spines, so just beneath the tail, are spiky and venomous as well. Anal spines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we so got anal spines. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one to have a chair for. <laughs> so um, they are all very venomous, and if you get spiked on those, especially on anal spines, uh, there you go. A little bit of extra <laughs> spice in those ones. So uh, because they are this actually really spiky unpleasant fish to deal with despite being incredibly beautiful to look at uh they don't have any natural predators in the atlantic ocean and the caribbean and their numbers just exploded and actually they're relatively small but incredibly they've just got a huge appetite and they eat all the little shrimps and crabs and baby fish oh shit and everything so do you the think they've been introduced from not from their habitat? Well, like I say, there's a lot of debate on on how they first ended up there. Whether some uh, a hurricane you know flooded someone's local mm. house and they got out of a tropical tank, or you know, there's. <coughs> Can you imagine if they actually were created in someone's laboratory? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they look alien <laughs> enough for it, don't they? So okay, uh, so yeah. we have these. So um, basically, when you when you go to the Caribbean, there's a lot of programs where you can you can't spearfish for anything else, but you can go spearfishing for these. But you just have to be really careful about how you handle them. And are they tasty to eat? Very tasty. They, yeah, they are they considered to be delicatess or not? Con- if you're careful in preparing them, you cut off all those spines. If if you then fillet them Except and get, anal get spines. <laughs> don't want those ones if you fillet them and get the flesh off the sides uh it's it's very tasty meat uh, and you know i've eaten a lot of them they you can prepare them in a number of different ways and they're really good to eat okay so lionfish what else what about stingrays sea urchins are fucking annoying man i stepped on one of them in <laughs> yeah. hawaii and i didn't know what the hell was it i stepped yeah. on it almost pissed myself ran out on the, on the beach and i'm like oh it's stepping on something oh oh it's a sea urchin and day, two days before that, I got stung by uh, by jellyfish, right? And I'm getting out. I had n- never encountered jellyfish in my life, and get out and uh, and like asking the the locals, guy, local guys, like, so what do I do? Oh, you need to pee. You need to pee on yourself. <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay. And yeah. then two days later, I stepped on a sea urchin, <laughs> and it's like, what do I do? Oh, you need to pee on yourself. And I was like, I'm not kidding. I was like. Do you guys pee on everything? <laughs> Anything hurts, stings, whatever, you just piss on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, make sure you so never how do, do you it again. Treat, <laughs> how do you treat the black eye to your mate? <laughs> oh, just piss on it. <laughs> awesome. 
So yeah, what else is they out? Yeah, the, 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 these the, the lionfish are nasty. They'll that'll hurt for it won't kill you, but it'll it hurts. Oh, so it's not going to kill you, but it's it's painful. It's it's, it's, it's extremely. And you need painful. to pee on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, really hot water denatures the protein. Uh, oh, okay. So proteins are kind of like molecules which work at a certain temperature because the molecule folds in a particular shape, which allows it to work. Mm-hmm. But if you heat it up enough, it starts heating up and unfolding. And that stops it from working. Oh, okay. So uh, a lot of these uh, natural poisons and venoms, if you heat them up outside of their optimal working range, you can make them ineffective and the pain goes away. And that's that's what happened to me with this. Um, hot water really alleviated the symptoms a lot. Um, how, the, how the hell did you... Um, was the lionfish attacked you or no so i was i was spearing them and um uh, yeah it's it's a lot of fun to to go spear fishing for them yeah i'd still do it but what actually happened is i speared one and um uh, uh, sometimes they and their get away. mates were just around the corner they fucked you up well i <laughs> i speared it through just below the 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 spines on the top yeah and Sometimes you you don't get a direct hit and the fish wriggles off and gets away and then you try and spear it again, mm-hmm. and that's what this one did. But what I didn't realize that I'd uh, as I'd speared it, like literally just glanced off the top of its mm-hmm. spine and actually broken off three of the spines in the the prongs of of the uh, of the spear. So when I went to reload the spear, oh. I just grabbed three of its spines and just went <coughs> straight into the palm of my hand, oh, shit. and. Initially, it was, you know, how sometimes you get like a, a pinpoint to something, and it's just like, oh, and you know, shook them off and went again and got the fish. And it was like, oh, I've heard that really hurts a lot. It doesn't hurt at all. And stupidly just carried on diving. Oh, no. About five minutes later, it's like, actually, my hand's starting to burn a little bit. Oh, and then about 10 minutes in, I'm like, yeah, I really need to get out the water now. 15, 20 minutes later, mate, I was in absolute agony. My my arm, arm swelled up all the way up to my shoulder. Um, my hand, it, it was it was agony for about eight hours. And the guys were, we didn't, we'd run out of gas on our uh, expedition camp. So of the course. guys were uh, heating up water in a, in a pot on the fire and bring it to me to then plunge my hand so into. all you need just the hot water that's it it's, nothing else it's the best thing for it and just kind of sit it out but it was it was really really unpleasant okay everyone stay hours. away from lionfish what else what else tell me what so else is the shitty out there jellyfish you mentioned yeah. I, i've had a, a nasty encounter with a jellyfish in the philippines um I, I still don't know what it was uh i never actually saw it in the water i was paddleboarding at the time uh, fell in the water and just some seaweed glanced past my arm mm. and it must have had a jellyfish in amongst it and one of the tentacles wrapped around my bicep like this and it felt like an electric shock yeah, yeah, yeah. it was that violence um, the stings and I brushed it off like looked in the water like what was that and I couldn't see anything uh, pulled out the water and I had like someone had whipped me uh, it was just this red lash. Microphone. Speaking of microphone. Red lash, <laughs> uh, like across my, my bicep. Yeah. And um, within eight hours, it had blistered up. So it was like a, a deep burn around my bicep. Oh, and it, it hurt like an absolute bastard. You and Do you know the uh, Men of War? Yeah. Jellyfish. Yeah. I have my mate, a really good friend of mine. Well, I won't go that far. But we know each other pretty b- for years now. He's a, uh, um, what do they call them? The water, the swims in uh, open water. Open swimmer. water swimmers, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. he did the English Channel, and he did four more, five more swims. Yeah, yeah. And one of them was uh, in Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. From one island to another, whatever yeah. this deal. And he got stung with the men of war. His name is Adam uh, Ocean Walker. That's yeah. his like. Yeah. Adam Walker, and uh, he basically there's a photo of him like the whole side was just stung with this uh, men of war, and he continued swimming. Mate. And he finished it. He had another like five hours to swim or something. Epic. That guy is just ridiculous yeah mate, it, it, it was uh, i mean i just had one lash if he, uh, I, I wouldn't like because the thing is it, it wasn't so much the pain straight away because i could deal with that but it, it like the blister popped and it scabbed up and then for a week it was fine but then it started itching like nothing i've ever experienced and it itched solidly without a break for a week no. and the more you scratched it 
the more itchy it became. Oh. I, I don't know why that happened, but it was just it it was horrible, man. And you know, if if he carried on swimming with with that pain, and I, I'd hate to think what the next couple of weeks after that was like. Oh, there you go. That's that's his stomach. Oh, boom. Yeah, you see, I just had one of those stripes across my bicep. Just and like he continued that. swimming. Oh. And he was like, he got sick, he was puking, he, everything. Oh, no, mate, he couldn't have been... This guy's nuts. That must have been really Isn't unpleasant. That, he's crazy, dude. I already did an interview with him a while ago, and I tried to get him on, on the podcast, but he just became father. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, yeah he's, he's busy at the he's moment. He's a little bit, yeah, busy. Yeah. He has a book and everything. Very, very interesting guy. Um, uh, so, yeah, jellyfish... Uh, li- uh, lionfish. lionfish. Those are the two that have really got a hold of me. Uh, I, I mean, I've I've had a few other encounters. Like you get, um, you know, microscopic life in the sea that can come sometimes sting you. And a lot of the places that I've dived, I don't wear a wetsuit because the water's quite warm. Mm. I actually really enjoy just putting on board shorts, putting on a tank, and hopping over the side. That's 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 me and my element. That's that's my best kind of diving. Okay, you supposed to know this one. What is that little parasite? What gets in your pee pee if you <laughs> if you decide <laughs> that's a, to? That's, that's a freshwater fish. That yeah. yeah. What is that? So th- there there is there is a legend of. Um, it's a fish in the Amazon River, which um, swims up your urethra and embeds itself there. There you go. It's somebody showing up straight away. But swims up urethra. Here you go. Yeah. That's a massive. It's a penis probing fish. I, I mean, I... You mean, look at the size of those things. I mean... You're, you have to have a, like a very big pee hole. Are, are you hung like an elephant? Is is all I'm getting at? You know. Oh god. Okay, so then it's more of a legend. It's not it's, really a real thing. It's it's a myth. Um, I, I and for you just to sit there and allow to to crawl it up. Well, that's the other thing. I, I think the I, I did read a little bit more into these stories at some points, and I think the fish are more designed to kind of get at gaps like wounds and get into gaps and then take a bite and get away. Yeah. Um, you know, th- there's one on someone's fingertips. So maybe a juvenile one could, could do some damage in places you'd rather. It oh, okay. So it's a bullshit. Yeah. Cool. Um, what about stingrays? Stingray. So there's a, it, manta is the one I did swimming with uh, these beautiful, huge yeah. black mantas. So are there like many different types of the mantis? So uh, manta rays are actually, uh, I mean, you, you're talking about, so uh, interestingly, th- these are all is elasmobranchs. So uh, elasmobranchs, elas, elastic, uh, these are animals that don't have hard skeletons. They have more like cartilage skeletons. Oh, right. So sharks are elasmobranchs, rays are elasmobranchs. So there's this big uh, category of, of animals. So that's actually related to the sharks that you're looking at over there. Mm. <coughs> this one is massive. Look at As one. are stingrays and eagle rays. So uh, manta rays are, are plankton feeders. They're a bit like your, your whale shark or your basking shark. They're not actually... They don't. They they eat on the microscopic animals in the water column. So you can swim quite safely with a manta yeah, yeah. ray, apart from the fact that they're huge. I mean, your oceanic uh, manta rays can get to, I think it's six meters from wingtip to wingtip. That's ridiculous. So if they did pick up speed and swim into you, you know, they'd probably yeah. do some damage. But that's the only way that they'd really hurt you. Yeah, yeah. Um, they don't actually, I don't think manta rays have a, a stinger. Whereas, you know, you know, the story of Steve Irwin, actual stingrays, which eats completely different foods. Um, stingrays themselves are flattened so that they can sit on the bottom. Yeah, they usually sit in like the uh, in hideout. And then if you. Yeah, don't so they're see on the them. stand and y- you actually see they are looking for shells and things that are that live underneath the sand. <laughs> look and at this comparison. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh <my> God. <laughs> oh, that's a perfect likeness. Like, Hello. You just call them Ray. Yeah. That's so cute. So th- th- they'll eat uh, shells um, from from under wa- uh, under the sand, yeah. and actually, um, 
The stingrays do a similar thing that they swim above the sand, but when they want to feed, they they dip down in. And the interesting thing about these guys is, you know, like clams and things are bivalves, so they're two shells which are stuck together, really hard mm-hmm. shells. Now it's really difficult to eat that. So what these guys have developed is they've actually got. Um, so they have little tiny hands, and they take a fork and yeah, a little knife. Put a little and fork and knife <laughs> between them. <laughs> so they've actually grown bones inside their throats. Oh, so they've got muscular throats and they've got bony plates inside them. And uh, th- the reason I found this out is because I was uh, at, at the SeaWorld in, in Durban. I was feeding one of them and uh, I accidentally got my, my thumb into its mouth as it took took the fish. And its lips are fine. It didn't have any teeth. And I was like, oh, this is this is all right. I'm We're talking about fish, by the way, those who just tuned in. <laughs> and this, <laughs> this eagle ray, basically then this thought, oh, that's that's something like a shell in my mouth. I need to crush that. And he just constricted his throat around my thumb. Oh my god! Really, mate? It 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 just about crushed my thumb before it realized that it was attached to something else, which wanted to come back out of its mouth. Oh wow! And, uh, so I pulled it out, but man, I had crush marks like all around my thumb. So what actually happens is they get the shell into their throat, and then they just crush these bony plates together and they crush the shell oh, and wow. get the meaty bits out and digest that and then they spit the shells out so um, this one looks asian yeah yeah there, <laughs> there you go <laughs> yeah so those are eagle rays um if you scroll back up a little bit um that one on the left with this the, one uh just below it this one yeah that oh one, yeah that's, that's it's an way longer ray. yeah so they they swim they don't swim along the bottom they swim in the water like the manta rays do and then when they want to feed, they just stick their noses down into the sands and dig about with their That's noses. so cool. Listen, this is the third segment. Let's do another one, like little one. Yeah. And then we're going to wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. Cool. Sounds good to me. It's like electro blankies. Yeah, it's a good shout, man. Okay, so we're talking about all sorts of uh, stingrays and, and poisonous creatures we can find in a... In water, sea and ocean. What is the percentage of seas and, and what is the percentage of oceans? Like out of salt water? Ooh. Um, <laughs> Such a random question. Gosh, uh, I think there's there's kind of a, a bit of a blurry line between what's a sea and what's an ocean, but uh, well, 70% of the, the planet is water, isn't it? Mm. The surface area, so. We are 90% water. <laughs> yeah, we are, aren't we? Yeah, yeah. there's water everywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so we wanted to talk about 360 bubble deep. Tell me, what is that? So while I was doing the underwater camera work, I was traveling to some pretty exotic and remote locations and Google Street View got in touch with me back when you know they had those big like green golf ball cameras that traveled around on the top of cars yeah, yeah, to capture yeah, yeah. street view images so they did a backpack version of that and i was going to a lot of places which were either uninhabited or just didn't have any people that could actually capture street view maybe they didn't have streets and things like this so they provided me with a backpack version of that so i could go to these remote islands and capture street views of the beaches and islands and so on that's a really cool job while i was doing my underwater camera work alongside that and uh i went out on one of these trips and they had obviously wanted to figure out a replacement for these expensive cars traveling everywhere yeah so they came up with these tiny 360 cameras and they must have farmed out the patent to a bunch but because a bunch of different manufacturers came up with pretty much the same design at around about the same time and they sent me out with this like 30 kilogram backpack version of that street view camera and also at the same time on my last trip said okay and take this it was the size of a mobile phone mm-hmm. take this take this camera with you we want you to trial it so I took this camera out and I took one photo with it it was basically better than that what that 30 kilogram backpack with all those 23 different SLR cameras on top of it was taking. Yeah. It was just, I was like, God, I've got to take this underwater and get this on a coral reef. Can you imagine taking a picture with this on a coral reef with fish over your head and corals all around you, sharks swimming by and all the rest of it? It's going to be amazing. So I looked around online, you know, are there underwater housings for this camera? There's nothing. So um, I just met 
Not and the underwater housing is uh, the protective. Uh, yeah, so kind of a uh, I mean, it's frame cameras, electronics, it. unless you protect it from the water. I mean, some of the GoPros now are completely waterproof, just yeah. as a camera, so you can take them under. But you know, ordinary cameras like we're filming this with, unless you yeah surround them they they're going to get wet so we needed to figure out a way you know there was nothing on the market these cameras were completely new there's nothing on the market to take them underwater so uh, i wanted to figure out a way to do that and uh, i just just uh, met my uh, girlfriend now wife at the time and mother of two kids there we go uh, two little ones uh, uh, a few years down the line now Whee! <laughs> and that's the reason why john can't stop um blowing his nose <laughs> <laughs> yeah they come back from nursery with all sorts of horrible lurgies so uh, yeah we um she's a design technology teacher and mm. uh she had i had i knew how to get this thing this camera underwater um uh, uh, she knew how we could make the design that i'd come up with so we made one of these and i went out on the trip i got street view of the beaches and i just took managed to get this thing working underwater and took some uh 360 photos and videos underwater of the coral reefs uh, beautiful indian ocean coral atoll and came back to the uk handed over the hard drives with the street view imagery to to google uh, along with that, and I just said, hey, and we took these underwater, you know, if you want to take a look at these, and didn't really think much more of it. And about three months later, they got in touch and said, hey, Street View Imagery has come out great, here's the links, and hey, um, that underwater housing you made, do you mind if you make four more of those that we can we can use them? I was like, so what, Google wants to buy these things off us? Hmm, may maybe other people will too. And we started making them and, uh, you know, we started a little company, a business. This is while I was training for the stunt register, so we needed some extra money. And um, we just started selling them. And this is a natural progression of that. 360 Bubble Deep was like the professional model that we came up with, um, which... You know, the original model that we produced went down to 10 meters depth, which, you know, as a scuba diver, you know, you know yeah, 10 it's meters, you... you it's nothing. It's, it's nothing, yeah. We it's start with 50 meters. We start there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, we wanted something which even tech divers would be able to use, and we came up with 360 Bubble Deep, which it's made... Uh, the domes are made by a submersible win window manufacturer. Um uh we rated to 150 meters but i think you could probably take that down to about a thousand meters before it would break there's a lot of safety i would like to see it. how those fish are mating <laughs> yeah exactly what was the name of the those angler fish, fish yeah angler yeah. fish yeah down at the depth yeah yeah the uh, angler fish are having a fun time and yeah. the bubble is there just filming it uh, yeah <laughs> just capturing it all yeah. yeah so it's it's um you know th this yeah so this is our little business. Uh, the, the coral reefs we're actually filming on. Uh, so that reef formation is probably, I mean, you can see how big it is. That's probably several hundred years old just mm -hmm. in the background. This is actually filmed off uh, <coughs> Henderson Island in the South Pacific. Um, did you ever watch that film in the heart of the sea? Uh, sounds familiar. So it's a uh, film with uh, Chris Hemsworth, Tom Holland. It's about uh, this whaling ship. It's yeah, yeah, it was like a Moby Dick's concept, yeah, wasn't so, it? So I've seen it, yeah. The, so, uh, Chris Hemsworth is so sexy <laughs> on it. The yeah. hair is floating in the wind and so everything. In the Heart of the Sea is actually based on a, a diary of uh, a whaler ship, a, a real whaler ship that was sunk by a bull whale that rammed the ship and sank it. And the crew members were set ad adrift in their row, row boats and drifted across the ocean. And in the film, you'll remember they get, uh, after they get set adrift, after their boat is sunk, they're in their row boats. They're drifting across the Pacific Ocean. Told you starving. hair is floating. Look at this. Oh, mate. It's all about hair floating. Oh, that, 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 that's just, yeah, mate. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> Dreamy. Um, so they're starving, they're running out of water, and they drift to this ocean, which is literally smack bang in the middle of the South Pacific, and they manage to get ashore there and find water. But they also find skeletons in the cave, which convinces them that they're just going to die there if they stay there, and they need to 
you know, get back in their boats and carry on. And eventually they did that and made it to South America, which is why we know the story and have the diary, which Moby, Moby Dick was, was based on. But uh, the island that they stopped in on was Henderson Island, and the skeletons you can actually still see in the cave on Henderson Island. And I've been to look at them uh, oh, wow. on Henderson Island. So, um, have, but you, have you seen this one in your travels? Uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that was just next to the skeleton. <laughs> 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 next to a piano lid. That Rose, she must have no, found it, uh. you dummy. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's uh, Henderson Island. It's, the, it's now in one of the world's largest marine protected areas. Mm. And the coral reefs off Henderson Island, are oh, that's, that's them over there. Really? Um, you know, th that's a 360 picture. So if you click and drag on it, you'll be able to spin the picture around. Yeah. So that's taken with our, our housing. And yeah, because 360 uh, stuff is very popular now also with skydivers. When yes, skydivers yeah. jump, they put, uh, especially when they do the um Because you can suit. pan around the shot. Yeah, it doesn't, yeah. it's such a crazy Super invention. Useful. Super it's useful. Nuts. Okay, so what is going on right now with this company? When did you guys start it? When did so you found it? We started in, we, we tested that in, that would have been uh, December of, uh, January of 2016, I think, and we started selling them. Uh, we made the company and started selling them to Google in uh, July of 2016. So we've been running about five years. Um, and how's the business? It's. I mean, you're still still running around with a fake gun, so I'm <laughs> guessing it's not that good. Well, I, I think I, I think I'd still be running around with a plain no, fake gun. No, you're no not one what of those. No, you're not. It's fun. No, shut up. I enjoy it. But um, Literally, if I would give you now a million bajillion dollars, you would still go and uh, wake up five o'clock in the morning and run with weirdos with guns. Mate, you get to be in Indiana Jones films and Marvel mm. films. And yeah, but one of the dudes who just get shot. You're not getting like a main part. God. Okay, we have different values, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I probably still would carry on doing stunt work. Yeah, so the I business is going well with this. But yeah, this is this is good. It's uh, it's paying for itself. It's not paying for us yet. But oh, okay. you know, uh, any startup goes through these phases. Yeah, um, of course. And uh, I mean, hey, the measure of it is five years later. It's still still up and running, and and still, I mean. It's just gorgeous. And then what you guys exactly, you mainly do the housing. That's what your mainly job is. Or Yeah, so we don't actually make the cameras themselves. Yeah. Uh, we make the housings. And um, that's kind of uh, one of the selling points for us was the housings we were making. You could actually put a number of different cameras in, provided they were <coughs> working on that same basic design. So GoPros, Ricos, mm. um, yeah, all those, uh, you need to up the resolution on that. How many so. different um, <coughs> housings do you guys have? Um, so we've got about four different models on the market at the moment. Um, yeah, put it up to 4K. I'll get it nice and sharp. Uh, we've got about four different models on the market at the moment. So the, the deep is... Um, our, our most expensive one, uh, a highest, a highest of the range, um, but we do have uh, others on the market as well. Um, we've got a live streaming version, so you can actually drop that in the water and live stream onto YouTube and other platforms uh, in 360, which is pretty cool. Um, mm, and nice. uh, yeah, uh, it's it's great because it kind of pays and gets you access to, pays for and gets you access to locations like this. And, I mean, being underwater uh, on a, in a place like this is just unreal. So when you say gets and gets an access, so you guys would go there and set them up? Is that the deal or you just sell them? Well, uh, look, we were supporting a research and conservation expedition on this trip and part of the... Uh, appeal for me to join in and lead this expedition was bringing 360 video to the table. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quite niche. It's quite a specialty. Not many people do this, but yeah. we do it quite well. And uh, that is it's a selling point, isn't it? Cool. No, this is amazing. It's great that 
something you, you what you were so passionate about and you're so knowledgeable about as well you can have that as a actually viable business and hopefully it's going to grow even bigger very when you're going to so. be too old to run around with fake guns yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and, got, and you got, got to think about that somewhere down the line yeah, especially you? when yeah. your daughter is going to be daddy what do you do for a living <laughs> well <laughs> <laughs> it was really funny one of the guys uh, uh his his daughter was going to school and he lives quite a long way from the studios and uh, she was saying, "Yeah, my daddy, he he beats up Thor, and uh, my daddy, he he does this, and he gets set on fire, and he gets blown up." And it came to parents' night, and the teacher was like, "Yeah, she's she's having some fantasies." <laughs> uh, what was she saying? Yeah, she was saying this and that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all of that is true. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. But this is something what I notice sometimes. I just forget that there are normal people out there. And uh, especially now where we're so busy working and you just surround with those nutters yourself or all the time. It's oh, you're going to a sudden fire, fell off the building, whatever, get beaten up, someone dislocated their shoulder. Yeah, cool, yeah, normal day. And then you just kind of go, like I would go somewhere sometimes to like a social event and, and uh, so, so like s- someone would introduce me like saying, oh yeah, he's stunned, man. And all of a sudden it just stop and they're like... Tell me everything. <laughs> I want to know everything. Yeah. And um, and to be uh, to be fair, I mean, I'm you know busting busting you a little bit around for like stunts and stuff. I do enjoy it. That's why I'm doing it as well. But unfortunately, we have those days when we sit around, we don't do much, and you know that's mm. that that's what I struggle with. I want action twenty four seven. Yeah, <laughs> and you know it's ev- every job is like that though, man. You know, military. 99% of the time it's sitting around waiting for something to happen. Uh, I did uh, some uh, anti-pi- anti-piracy work in the Indian Ocean when the Somalian pirates were kicking off. Mm. And, you know, you're protecting oh, ships. Not them again. Going across the, the ocean and you're just sitting there waiting. For, you, you get into to stunts. You're sitting there waiting for something to happen. Uh, you know, uh, underwater work, 90% of the time it's organizing actually getting out there yeah, and then yeah, of course. sorting out the films and video once you've been or you know writing up the the research paperwork the publications afterwards so you know but everyone always advertises the glamorous side of it but that's true you know, that's but, true. You know we, we were just talking about it you know earlier it's so you you get these skills that you can go and perform in front of a camera but actually it's it's all the training that actually gets you to a point where you're actually sufficiently skilled to be in front of the camera. And, you know, in in water, I, I was just blessed with an upbringing that gave me the skill set to be able to do that. But I've really had to work at martial arts. I didn't have any background in that or gymnastics or mm. trampolining or any of those things to actually get in front of a, a camera and uh, do a convincing, you know, screen fight. And but it was great for you to get out of that comfort zone and to learn those very things. Very much yeah. so, but but that's the thing. It's yeah. it's been fun. It's it's been a focus for my fitness. I mean, you know, when you when when you've been doing fitness training for 10, 20, 30 years, uh, what do you do to keep it fresh? Well, become a stunt man. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn all sorts of new things that you'd never even tried before. I mean, in my late thirties I started learning to do gymnastics and trampolining. Yeah, very similar. And then for high me, diving. Yeah. You know, it's just and those are those are things which I dreamed of doing as a kid mm. but never actually had the and now we can do it as an old man. <laughs> and now we now we get to do it as old men and try and break ourselves. <laughs> yeah. Oh um, John. Listen well <sighs> Thank you so much for coming over, man. We had a good chat. Um, it's uh, here in UK. It's quite cold, but we have these heating blankies. We have a garden heater there. Uh, before we wrap this all up, um, I just wanted to ask you a couple things. For those who maybe struggle about their life changes in life, kind of like, oh, do I want to do this? Or or like, what are the suggestions? Because like the things what you went through, you know, going from you know it's university studying something and you realize okay that's not mine at least you were brave enough to just say that's mm. not mine and how many people will just go continue and then they get a job and they still hit their job and they continue doing it so what would your would be your suggestion for people who struggle to make that decision uh, i think choose the life that you want because i have always wanted to pursue the things which I enjoyed over and above my comfort and I have suffered for it I've been broke three times in the long last 10 years 
And when you're in your 30s, girls don't want to know, God, oh, that's broke. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm lucky I found one that, that, that she's all right. found some value in me beyond my wallet. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I've, I've got other friends who stuck with the engineering degree. Uh, you know, my be- one of my best mates from high school went straight to university, studied at university while he was staying at his friends, uh, at his, uh, with his mom and dad at home. Uh, then went straight out of that into the job, which he's still in now, 20, 25 years later, um, uh, earning good money. He paid for his first house in cash, paid for his first car in cash, moved out of his parents' house when he got married, um, basically lived the textbook stable life. Now, his kids are in their late teens and are just about moving up the house. He's never known what it's like to be hungry without money, wondering what, what's going to come next. Now, he looks at my life probably and thinks, damn, that guy's made some stupid decisions. Mm. But, uh, and he suffered for it because he's been broke. He's wondered where he is. He's... He's in his early 40s and now he has two little kids rather than two kids that are just about growing up so he can start thinking about retirement. Um, and it, it's, it really is choose choose what's going to turn you on. For, for me, I think about the stability of that life and I can see the rewards that come with that, but I know that I would be bored out of my mind trying to live that life. Um, but that's a very fulfilling life for someone that's geared that way. Mm. So decide what you want out of life and then pursue it. And for me, um, I remember breaking up with a girlfriend once when I, I was broke and I broke up with her because it was the right thing to do. But I, I was, she was basically providing the means for me at the time. <laughs> Was she your sugar mama? She, uh, I, I think she. I think she assumed. <laughs> or charity, that, more like a charity. Well, well this is the thing. I, I, th- I think she kind of assumed that uh, she would get. Uh, you know, we, we basically came to to a point where uh, we needed a meeting of minds to to move forward, and uh, she kind of dug her heels in, and it was like, uh, you know, that isn't going to work for me. You're basically getting your own way. We need to meet in the middle here. I can give up something. You need to give up something. And she wouldn't, and uh, I basically left, and you know it, it it put me completely out on the pavement. Um, but I did that because it, it was the right thing to do. Mm. Um, if I wanted to move forward in a relationship, yeah. I wanted to know that we c- it was a mutual relationship and not a one sided one. Um, but it was not a secure thing to do. It was an uncomfortable thing to do. So I think choose what you want from life and then live that choice um, uh, which is what I've done and actually you know I'm, I'm now in a place where yeah running around with plastic guns I actually enjoy that hey, stuff hey that's that's what it's all about getting around man. underwater I enjoy that stuff so you know I finally found a way of making it pay for itself yeah but, you know uh, yeah but that's that's the bottom line what, you do whatever the fuck you want to do do what you enjoy to do, even if it's running around with plastic guns. Yeah, you know, and yeah. then meeting weirdos like me who's gonna, tan- uh, gonna <laughs> twist your arm on a you. Sunday evening to, to come and have a conversation. Exactly, and know <laughs> you just yeah. get out, and you're like, oh, I got out from my family finally. Really. <laughs> Listen, thank you so much, buddy. Thanks, bro. Bush, we done, and little music, and then do you have a sh- do you have dancing moves? Not that you'd want to see. <laughs> <laughs> I got some. I got some. Okay, we done. Both. Brilliant.